This is All India Radio. We now bring you an exclusive interview with Dr. Surjit Bhalla, Executive Director for India at International Monetary Fund, Washington. Interviewer is Sonu Sood, AIR correspondent. We have with us today renowned economist Dr. Surjit Bhalla, former member of PM's Economic Advisory Council and currently Executive Director at the IMS. We will discuss with him various highlights of the chapter written by him success of people-centric policies in the recently released book, Modi at 20, Dreams Meet Delivery, a compilation of chapters offered by eminent intellectuals and domain experts, highlighting various aspects of 20 years of Sri Narendra Modi's inspiring journey at the political hem, first as the CM of Gujarat for three successive terms and for the last eight years as the Prime Minister of India. Dr. Bhalla, a warm welcome to you from All India Radio. Thank you very much for having me. Sir, to begin the discussion, we would like to know from you, what uh, is the main reason, according to you, for the stupendous response that Mr. Narendra Modi got whenever he stood for a major election? What is the mantra of his extraordinary political success? What, according to you, are the key aspects of his persona, his vision, and his governance style that has touched the hearts of the people? The first and the most important point is that PM Modi, as well as Chief Minister Modi, was directly concerned with the welfare of the poor or the bottom 50, 60, 70 percent. So the poor is a very broad, it's not the absolute poor, but it is those who belong to the lower strata of society. He is the first leader in independent India to concentrate on this share of the population. We've had, as you know, Karibi Atao has been a slogan forever in Indian political discourse, as well as economic discourse, as well as discussions at the, at the level of policymakers. However, we should also remember Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi's famous observation and a correct observation in 1985 that most of the monies meant for the poor did not reach the poor. Stated differently, there was corruption, there was leakage, and those that were supposed to have obtained that money did not get it. And this was in the context of the PDS program back in 1984-85 when Rajiv Gandhi just been elected. Now, put that in perspective. So here we have, we are concentrating on delivering to the poor and the poor are not getting the money. And indeed, the rich are getting the money or the elite are getting the money or the non poor are getting the money. This money didn't disappear. It went to people's pockets, i.e. corruption. So when the people saw in Gujarat and, you know, there are various aspects of his emphasis that there was actual delivery and the delivery in and there's a whole host of programs where there has been delivery and you know so the title of the book is correctly dreams meet delivery now these are not the dreams of the rich these are the dreams of the downtrodden these are the dreams of the poor the mass of india and remember that 30 40 years ago Absolute poverty in India was something like 50-60%. And so, in other words, it's a large population which is not being helped, was not being helped. And then you have a chief minister who comes on the scene and actually starts delivering. So, I think the key aspect is performance. Prime Minister Modi, previously Chief Minister Modi, has performed up to people's expectations and perhaps, and I would say, exceeding people's expectations because this was so different for us, for Indians, to see actual delivery happening and delivery to those who needed it the most. In fact, you have highlighted the accelerated progress in female empowerment and upliftment of the poor since 2014 in your chapter and attributed it to the utmost sincerity of the current government to keep the poor at the center of their attention. Do you think Prime Minister Modi's humble background has made him a more empathetic leader who can actually understand the suffering, the trials, and the aspirations of the poor? I think it does have something to do with it. 
two points. First, that he is the first leader to not be, not come from a first non-Brahmin leader. There have been two non-Brahmin leaders before, VP Singh and Manmohan Singh. And while they were not, and one of them was elite from the beginning, and the other grew from humble backgrounds and achieved tremendous success in terms of education and being the PM. But Prime Minister Modi and Chief Minister Modi was much more in touch with the people that who elected him. The second part of his success, I think, look, he, you know, if you are from the mountaintop and you look down, what do you observe at the time that he got elected chief minister? What you observe at that time is that there's one community, one very large 50% of the population that has been discriminated against by in every strata of society, women, girls, infanticide, feticide. So long before female empowerment became a buzzword amongst policymakers around the world, Prime Minister Modi and Chief Minister Modi saw it very early and therefore orient his policies towards empowerment. Now, you could think of it that this was, obviously it was a correct policy and politically correct policy and economically correct policy. And I think this combination that it was much needed. It was, he was ahead of his time in terms of emphasizing this. And then, you know, people respond. They say that, look, here is a person, here's a leader who's answering to our needs. And I think that is why, despite various forms of opposition to him, primarily from the elite, he has succeeded beyond all expectations. And the first time was, 2014, the first time on the national stage, when really not many people gave him a chance to win, let alone win with a majority. And second, in 2019, to the peak with a majority. So it is clearly he connects. The other leaders who connect, but at the national stage, there are very few people in the world, I think, very few leaders in the world who have connected with a large mass of the population as effectively as uh, Prime Minister Modi has. In this context, you think the grassroots and inclusive approach of Mr. Narendra Modi, who has talked openly about issues like open defecation, about sanitation, about pro-poor policies like toilets, which probably the earlier PMs uh, did not consider politically correct or politically successful issues to bring out in the open or felt maybe a little embarrassed about. You feel this approach has enhanced his mass appeal? Absolutely. It is. And I myself was very surprised, like most people were, when from the ramparts of the Red Fort, in his independent state speech, he talks about the evils of open defecation. And, you know, in most polite societies, including in India, you didn't talk about this in public. And here was the prime minister saying that, look, we have to solve this problem. So I think wherever you go, it is the the appeal. Now, other other leaders, for example, there's a story of the bicycle, providing bicycles to girls, which was done by Nitish in Bihar. And actually, there is a bicycle program that Chief Minister Modi had started in Gujarat before. And we don't hear that much about it. We hear much more about the Nitish Kumar. So I think it is people look on, have looked on him as responding to their needs. And as I said, I think the real comparison is not necessarily with other leaders in India, is with other leaders worldwide. And in that sense, Prime Minister Modi Chief Minister Modi has been pretty much close to unique in terms of his dedication and in terms of his emphasis. And, you know, I've been a student of poverty for a long time, maybe too long, but it is to now witness in India that extreme poverty has been eliminated. Very successful approach that Prime Minister Modi took in terms of the epidemic. And this came out very much 
in the recent elections, since we are talking about successful politicians, in the recent UP elections, many poor people pointed out that this was a lifesaver. And it is also, I think, not just the program is allowed, not just that the poor get it, but there is efficiency in the poor getting it. That is a big contrast. As I mentioned earlier, all leaders talk about Garibi Hatal, and but very few are actually successful in achieving that goal. And in its various dimensions, Look, there was toilets we discussed. There is absolute poverty in terms of food. There's chulas in terms of health. Again, women's health. And now bank accounts. So they have empowerment. And various surveys have shown that the usage of bank accounts by women has gone up extraordinarily compared to the past. And in my travel which I talk about in the article. This is in Madhya Pradesh, and this is when the program had just started or was in effect for two, three years. And uh, this is in 2018, 2019. And what I found most heartening was how the women in a village, in a poor village, there were some women who had got the toilets given by the government. And there's some women had not. And these are the women who are very vocal. You know, I've traveled across India quite extensively. And these women cornered me up and they said, you know, we should be getting the toilet. And then we discussed that, yes, it has to go through various loops. Not everybody can be provided with a toilet immediately. And they understood that. But at the same time, they were very, very emphatic that it was their right to get a toilet given that the government had announced it, and given that other people, they, they saw that other people, and I witnessed the toilets being constructed, toilets already constructed, etc. So this is a mega change. The other change in India, and which I talk about in my article or in my chapter, is on education. Again, it is not just education for everybody, but especially for the girl child. Beti Pachao, Beti Padao. And now you have India as one of the very, very few countries in the world, in the developing world, where there's parity in educational attainment of girls and boys. And indeed, like some developed countries, India has more women in college than men. So we've come a long way. We've made a lot of progress. And I imagine more remains. But the delta, I keep emphasizing in my discussions, in my articles, that the most important element is the delta. And by delta, I mean the change. And that, the fact that people have seen the change, proving of the change, because it benefits them. I think you have encapsulated that in one sentence that you have written. It's a beautiful sentence. In your article, a basic accounting of the Modi years shows that what the elite took for granted is now the experience of the poor. Yeah, no, and this is, and I have done studies other countries as well, and perhaps in my future work, I will try and evaluate how PM Modi compares to other world leaders and in their provision of either poverty elimination or provision, you know, we used to call it basic needs. You know, I haven't talked about the housing program that was started and is quite successful. Two and a half lakhs for the construction of a house has been provided. And so water, housing, so food, LPG, so all the basic education. So we are now a much more equal society or going to be a much more equal society. It's a younger generation that has really benefited. And it is that time period that I think is part of Modi's success that he has provided and succeeded in providing. And that, I think, is what for the middle class, the lower middle class, even the upper middle class appreciate the most. And now you have, you know, the economic growth in India is rebounding. You know, I have always been in since 91, claimed that this was India's decade. And I do think that the 21 to 31 
decade in India, the post-COVID decade in India, will be amongst the best decades that India has ever experienced, both absolutely as well as relative to other countries. You just mentioned COVID. How do you see the handling of the COVID crisis by the government under the leadership of Mr. Modi? Given that these structural reforms which were introduced, uh, do you think this was a perfect example of turning a crisis into an opportunity? In other words, I have looked at the COVID response and the lockdown. Now, here, what is remarkable about Modi as a leader is willing to indirectly acknowledge missteps in policy. And one misstep in policy was lockdown. And uh, we saw its effects in India. We saw that it hurt the poor or the migrants, etc. We all know. And immediately, we were one of the first countries to enter into a lockdown in end of March 2020. And possibly the first country to emerge from a lockdown with an alternative policy framework of combating the epidemic. And uh, we've seen that in the record. Now, this was the recognition that maybe lockdowns were not the best policy response, was took a lot of political courage. And as I said, the most countries delayed their attack on or emergence out of lockdowns. We were the earliest. And then on the food program that made sure that look, economic activity is down. What is most important is that the people stay, at least have a minimum satisfaction of food and the doubling of the the food to 10 kilograms per person per month from 5 kilograms per person per month and making sure they got it and got it at zero cost. This is, we had always thought about how Indian bureaucracy can be effective through the Kumbhela and other such. But this one on a national scale to make it work was truly a compliment to the Indian bureaucracy and it's a compliment to the political leadership that it worked as well as it did. Uh, does PM's style of communication where he addresses the nation with a lot of feeling and warmth uh, touch an emotional chord with most Indians you feel and you know, makes them feel special and connected to the process of nation building. In fact, there's a very interesting line in your uh, chapter where you have called uh, PM Modi's Independence Day speeches as harbingers of change. So could you tell us a little about that? This is, Modi has been criticized for not communicating directly to the people. And I think it's an unfair criticism because I take the Independence Day speeches where he, as you and others, I've listened to many an Independence Day speech. But you look at Modi's Independence Day speeches, they are full of policies, they're full of communication, they're full of ideas, and then he puts it into practice. So I think I keep coming back to the reason for the phenomenal political success, economic success, popularity with the masses. Prime Minister Modi, is that he communicates with the people where it matters. It's not that and the monkey bath, etc., is another form of communication. But I think independent of all that, it is the effectiveness and the rightness of the policies that is it communicates the most. You can have great speeches, etc. Actually, witness three or four of his election speeches. I mean, he's a fantastic orator, but that's not the only quality. The public speaker, I I think there are very few people, actually, I can't think of any, anybody else on par or at least approaching Modi's effectiveness of communication and oratory. But I think that is neither necessary nor sufficient. What is important is the delivery, and that is what he does uh, most. As you said that in every Independence Day speech, like Beti Bachao, Beti Parhao, you mentioned, that was announced in the first Independence Day speech of uh, 2014 of the present government. So that significance is always attached to the speeches. If you didn't, it's one of those things, you know, that exposed, it sounds like the most obvious thing. But the question I raise in the book, why didn't other political leaders 
have, you know, the Independence Day speech is a regular permanent feature of Indian democracy and Indian prime ministers. And why did it take until 2014 for this to be made as one of the major vehicles of policy communication and on change? So I think he does have the touch. <laughs> he does have an understanding. And a good question, and to which I do attempt to answer a little bit in my chapter, what makes him so understanding? And what I come up with is that perhaps it's his humble background that leads him to the right policies and to the right emphasis and implementation. And let us not forget that we've all talked about the correct policies, except for uh, sanitation, which was not considered correct, but others. But it is the delivery and it is to respond to the dreams of the people and by the people, the large mass of the population that is aspiring. We moved from a poor country, um, from poor people to aspiring people. And that is one of his biggest contributions to Indian society and Indian polity. Sir, there is a tonic shift from policy paralysis of the previous government to the rapid reforms under the present government, be it digitization, the startup boom. We are seeing a lot of uh, development in various sectors. How far would you attribute this welcome shift to PM Modi's able leadership? Well, a lot of it. And I would say that the time cometh and the, the leader cometh. As you know, in PM Modi was elected in 2014 at the national stage, and we had gone through decades of corruption. So in some sense, it was a necessary outcome that delivery and corruption, corruption be reduced. I don't think it's eliminated. I don't think in any society corruption is eliminated, but that's part of human nature. But it is to diminish corruption. That is what has been achieved. And in terms of the diminishing of corruption has to do with the correctness of the policies and the implementation of those policies. So we've all known as economists, you know, what is a correct policy and but it's the implementation. So I think there are several stages and you're absolutely right. Uh, I haven't seen the word policy paralysis at all. There is discussion of why the famous farm laws or the infamous farm laws or non-implementation. And that's the politics. We are democracy. And there are surprises in a democracy. Often political leaders will do things which is not in the national interest, but that's a price one pays for being democratic. So, but I think that's the issue of we can get some of these major reforms undertaken is the big story uh, rather than policy paralysis. You have said something in your chapter which brings out the ethos of the last eight years of the government and the coming times. You have said Modi's first term will be remembered as the development years. His second term as when development took the next major step forward towards India being a major player in the world economy. Can you expand a little on that and what yeah. can we look forward to? Well, it's already happening. And again, we've seen this recently in terms of various uh, international episodes and developments that we are the fastest growing economy today, major economy, and likely to be for the next decade, at least the IMF forecast is, at least for the next six years. And, and our population is not small, it's 1.4 billion. And 1.4 billion people expanding at the rate of 6 to 7% per annum growth means you're going to be a major player on the world stage in terms of contribution to world GDP, in terms of leading on the world stage. And what we also have that, uh, you know, China is slowing down and for various historical reasons, demographic reasons, 
and the fact that economists have various explanations, but the fact remains it is very, very likely that Indian GDP growth uh, will be somewhat higher, and I would say two to three percentage points a year higher than China for the next decade. And this obviously has a major role to play on the world stage. There is the Quad that has been set up. There is the Indo-Pacific Partnership in which India is a major player, will be a major player. And these are all signs of how the stage has changed. And India is now asserting itself, rightfully so, meaningfully so, and with performance. It is not, we are just not a a poor, populous country anymore. We are now a lower middle income size country. And, you know, PM Modi had said in 2019 that uh, we will be or we should be a $5 trillion economy by 2025-26. And it is very likely that we will reach there. Indeed, the pandemic, this was this statement by PM was made in 2019, before the pandemic. So the latest IMF forecast is that we will be a $5.1 trillion economy in 2026, just one year later than the expectation of 2019. So I think these are all signs and we are going to the presidency of the G20 is next year by India. So I think the growth, the performance, the political stability, foreign investment, our openness to international investments and growth, and so all, everything is coming together for this to be truly India's decade. Sir, to conclude, uh, the motto of the government, Sapka Saath, Sapka Vikas, Sapka Vishwas, Sapka Prayas, you think this epitomizes the all-inclusive approach of the government where it wants the nation to take rapid strides in development, but with everybody contributing to and benefiting from the process of nation building? So the key aspect there is inclusive, as we have discussed and as my chapter discusses, whether it is the poor, whether it is uh, women, whether it is a downtrodden, they have all participating in the growth process. Education, widespread education. So we are very much sabke saath, sabka vishwas, sabka vikas. So it is for those of us who've gone through the India, I was born one year post-independence, and we witnessed a lot of aspirations, a lot of demands for change, but did not see that constructive a change as we are now witnessing over the last six, seven years on the national stage. And I think that's the hope that people have. That's the belief that people have. And I think that's the explanation for the astounding success of Prime Minister Modi as a political leader, as a national leader, and now very soon, and as it is emerging, as an international leader. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhalla, for taking time out, talking to us, and giving a deeper insight into what has led to the extraordinary political success of our Honorable Prime Minister, Narendra Modi. Thank you, Farah. You are listening to an exclusive interview with Dr. Surjit Bhalla, Executive Director for India at International Monetary Fund, Washington. Interviewer was Sonu Sood, AIR Correspondent. This program was produced and presented by the New Services Division of All India Radio. You can listen to it on our mobile app, News on AIR. This program is also available on our YouTube channel, News on AIR Official. You may email your opinion about this program at airnsdtalks at gmail.com.